a pharmacy tech with a drug addiction. Whether it was stealing the drugs or forging prescriptions or whatever it was that I needed to do to, to get my fix. Why she's now running one of the largest recovery programs in Minnesota. Plus, a timely fiction novel based in fact. New York Times bestselling author Joel Rosenberg is here to discuss his latest high stakes thriller, that and more, on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. We've all heard the motto adopted by our nation's police officers to protect and serve. Well, one officer in Santa Rosa, California, takes serving to heart. School resource officer Chris Morrison is also a former teacher who worked with high-risk students. She recently met a special needs girl named Raquel. Late last week, Raquel was having a difficult time moving from the hallway to the outdoors. She'd been frozen in place for more than an hour. Teachers tried but were unable to calm her, and that's when Officer Morrison stepped in. Someday we'll find in the rainbow connection The lovers, the dreamers, and me Did you know Kermit sings that song? No? Mm -hmm. I love Kermit. When you see the video and the way at the end Raquel turns and smiles, that says it all. It's, it's, she was, she knew, and that, I think, really made that connection special, seeing that this officer knew the song too. That young lady's smile uh, made my day, made my week, made my year. I mean, just absolutely a moment I won't forget, and it reminds me why I'm in the profession I'm in. Well, I'm not sure I would know the Kermit song. That was a rainbow connection, <laughs> for certain. What a, you know, what, what, what that there were more <laughs> like this woman. How, how wonderful. I mean, she got it. She stepped in. She, sometimes we try with, with children or adults that have special needs to move them in the same way we would be enticed to move ourselves or to direct them in mm -hmm. the same way. And you know, we just need to come sit down on the floor and get with them, <laughs> you know, uh, eyeball to eyeball. One of the things that really struck me about that was how far she was, how, how she said, I'm going to respect mm -hmm. your space, I'm going to respect where you are emotionally right now, I'm not going to try to invade, I'm not trying yes, to, uh, I'm not going to try to force a thing, uh, I'm just going to sing a song to you. Sensitive and tender, great qualities. Well. As a former anchor of Good Morning America and The View, Paula Ferris is no stranger to interviewing the newsmakers of the day. Now, as a podcast host, she's still using those skills. Only this time, Paula's asking her guests some very different questions. If God put something on your heart, you can't run from it. <laughs> or you can try, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna work out well. So Paula Ferris took a leap of faith in 2018, she stepped down from her successful run as co-host on The View and left the anchor desk of Good Morning America Weekend to pursue what she calls a passion project with the ABC Network, a podcast called Journeys of Faith with Paula Ferris. I really wanted to give listeners an opportunity to hear from newsmakers and um, from influencers. What does their faith journey look like? What gets them through their chapters of triumph and their chapters of tragedy? What holds them together? Paula says her relationship with God keeps her grounded at work in an additional role as ABC senior national correspondent and at home as a wife and mother. During a rough patch early on in her marriage, she relied on faith to keep her family together. We've been married 18 years now, thank God. Um, but it's been a lot of work and we were just talking about it recently. You know, thank God we didn't abandon our relationship. Even though at that moment, it didn't feel like there was much worth fighting for. When it came to our marriage, we stuck it out. And I can really only say it's because of God. You know, it's at that moment, neither of us really, even though I had moved out, neither of us had a real peace about it. And so we stuck it out. We have three beautiful kids and we're doing so well now. She says making a distinction between her identity and career was a breakthrough to a more stress-free, fulfilled life. That was the main reason why I stepped away from anchoring GMA weekends and from The View. I didn't feel like I really had much of a work-life balance. It was hard to step away from those two jobs that I didn't realize had I defined me so much. And I just have to remember to give myself as much grace as I give other people 
and that it's not about being perfect. It's about a journey and to love myself and to love others through it. And, you know, it, it helps too that, you know, I've surrounded myself. My friends really couldn't care less what I do for a living. During her podcasts, she's hoping to empower and encourage listeners through conversations with guests from varying faith backgrounds, including celebrities and influencers like Luke Bryan, Sherry Shepard, and Reza Aslan, to name a few. I've had a guest on that was an atheist and another that was Muslim, which I learned a ton about about Islam. And I think some of the more profound conversations that we have as Christians are with people that we don't necessarily see eye to eye with. And it's important in this moment to sit down and listen to people and respect people, no matter where they're coming from, and show them love. So who would she love to invite for a future episode? I'd love to get Snoop Dogg on, I'm just telling you. He released a gospel album about a year ago. He's had this sudden resurgence or rediscovery or conversion to Christianity. And I feel like people don't give him a chance. I would love to have him on the podcast and give him an opportunity to talk about it. Paula has high expectations for the next season of Journeys of Faith. And you know, the first season, it's you try to figure out what works and what doesn't. You try to see how people are gonna receive it. And people, you know, were very receptive to it. And I'm super excited and I know, once again, you know, there's that fear, oh my gosh, are people gonna listen? But I know, once again, if God calls you to do something, He'll equip you. Paula Ferris, sharing her own journey of faith as a reflection of God's love. I'm nothing without my relationship with Jesus. And that's the thing, it's not a religion, it's, it's a relationship. And, you know, I just try to ask myself, how would Jesus handle this situation? You know, do people see Jesus in me? That's the thing too. And sometimes I feel like I might be the only Jesus that you might see today. And this might be my only crack. So it's just, for me, it's a constant reminder of the magnitude of the responsibility that we have as Christians to love God, love people, and show them the love of Jesus. Oh, really wise words. Mm -hmm. So Terry, I gotta ask you, are you ready to interview Snoop Dogg? Sure, I mean, I, you know, I'm, ready I'm not ready or unready, I think. <laughs> No, with, with all that she said about him, I don't really follow Snoop Dogg. So well, he I'm, put out a gospel album, and then yeah. there was some backlash that, wait a minute, your lifestyle has not, been, yeah. you know, you've been very public in what you're doing, and this is not Christian. And then That'd he came back and said, well, I, you know, I thought church was a place for sinners. And mm -hmm. um, he's right. He's right. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Go Snoop Dogg. Yeah, you know, if the <laughs> Apostle Paul is captain, I'm first lieutenant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, 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 it is provocative, in, in, but in a way, we need to be provocative. Absolutely. We need to have that. I remember interviewing Brian Head Welch, and, and he calls himself the heavy metal monk now. And he <laughs> came out of this heavy metal band, Korn, and had a radical conversion uh, and was trying to find his way. And in the interview, uh, I just was stunned. Here is a man who, uh, by all outward appearances, is yeah. saying, I'm not a Christian. But he, from his innermost being were co were, was coming the, the prayers of the Apostle Paul yes. that he had memorized and had adopted into his life so he couldn't help but speak these. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a real eye-opener for me that don't judge by the exterior. Right. God never does. He always yeah. judge, judges by the heart. I think God lets us bump into those scenarios every once in a while in our lives to remind Mind us this. what he's interested in. Because sometimes I've even thought that about, you know, people that have been heroes of the faith in scripture that have had great failings. And I've thought, but God, you know, <laughs> and always the answer has been, but I know his heart or her heart. And, you know, I do think that we need to learn yeah, something. Learn the that. difference yeah. between a David and a Saul. Yeah. What, what, was that deciding factor, and it's not a visible one. Well, up next, a deadly nuclear alliance between Russia, Iran, and North Korea. New York Times bestselling author Joel Rosenberg is here to discuss his latest international thriller, Don't Go Away. Well, last week, President Trump met with Kim Jong-un in hopes of convincing the North Korean dictator to halt the country's nuclear weapons program. Globally, the nuclear threat is becoming more fact than fiction. Could Iran and even Russia be working with North Korea to form a deadly nuclear alliance? New York Times bestselling author Joel Rosenberg believes it's possible. Take a look. 
The Persian Gamble is the next international thriller from Joel C. Rosenberg. You'll be thrust inside a terrifying nuclear gamble between Russia, Iran, and North Korea, where the fate of the free world hangs in the balance. Joel C. Rosenberg's fact-based fiction is timely and chilling. Don't miss the page-turning action of The Persian Gamble, where America as we know her could be changed forever. The Persian Gamble. Well, Joel's with us now, and let's talk about the book, book, The Persian and Gamble. You set it up that while the world is distracted, Iran gets a nuclear weapon out of North Korea. How, how likely do you think that scenario is? Well, so I was in the Oval Office uh, last week with President Trump, mm -hmm. first, my first meeting, and he asked me, so give me the elevator pitch of your no new novel. And I said, Mr. President, what if the Iranian regime takes the $150 billion that President Obama gave them for the insane Iran nuclear deal and takes that money and secretly goes to try to buy fully operational nuclear warheads, of which North Korea has al almost 60 of them. And the president said, wow, well, how do you know that's not happening already? <laughs> I said, well, I'm trusting you and the secretary of state here and national security advisor, the vice president, to make sure the, per the Persian gamble never comes true. I don't think it's happening at the moment, mm. but North Korea is a country that has nuclear weapons and ICBMs are capable of reaching the, north, uh, the west coast of the United States. Iran wants both of those things, weapons and missiles, but they have cash and North Korea does not have cash. So th this could be a match made in hell. I mean, I don't think it's that implausible. It's certainly the, the basis of a chilling political thriller, but I actually don't think it's that implausible. And so I give President Trump enormous credit, and I said it to his face, uh, having been a never-Trumper in the 2016 campaign, but I changed, and I said, you have scrapped the Iran nuclear deal, and you are pushing the North Koreans to give up their weapons, and I say, God bless you for that. All right, well, fill in the blank for our viewers. What is Iran's end game? What are they trying to achieve if they get nuclear weapons? Well, that's a great question, Gordon, because this alliance, this axis of evil that's forming between Russia North Korea and Iran, they're all driven by different political philosophies and different religious theologies and eschatologies. Iran's end game is they're trying to prepare the way for the coming of their so-called Messiah, the 12th Imam. How do you do that? You hasten the coming of this so-called Messiah by creating the conditions of chaos and carnage. How do you do that? By acquiring nuclear warheads and the missiles to deliver them, to attack the great Satan, which they believe is the United States, and the little Satan, which is that they believe is Israel. Now, being a citizen of both those countries, uh, I have a vested interest in, in and concern for both of these countries. So that's their end game. Wipe out Israel, wipe out America, and, and set into motion the coming of the end of days. So that's chilling, but they don't they're not there yet. They don't have these weapon systems. And in the Persian gamble, they're deciding, let's publicly look like we're keeping to the Iran nuclear deal, but privately, let's co try to buy these weapons off the shelf. What's in it for Russia? Because you would assume Russia knows the ideology, that they've studied it and they've got a handle on it, uh, certainly with the, their own problem with Muslim terrorism. Uh, they wouldn't want to put nuclear warheads into that kind of ideology. Right. What's in it for them? Well, I'm not sure that, uh, in, that in real life, uh, President Putin has studied the eschatology, the theology. I mean, most American leaders haven't either. Oh, it right. seems so crazy. The reason it, it doesn't seem crazy well, to for us... Me it's fundamental. If you don't understand the motivation behind the, the behavior, you're never going to come to any kind of agreement. That's right. Uh, you know, I, I was really scratching my head during the Obama administration to hear the director of national security say the Muslim Brotherhood is a social welfare organization. I'm going, are you crazy? <laughs> exactly. Uh, you exactly. clearly are unqualified for the job you hold. Well, that's, that's right. And I, I think that in this case, Vladimir Putin is so arrogant and he so believes that he is driving the agenda, that he's building an alliance with countries that are anti-America in the, in the extreme, but he feels like he can control it. I don't think that he can, but I think that he thinks that he can. That makes it even more dangerous. The Iranian regime is uncontrollable. They have their own apocalyptic agenda. And I think, you know, as, a, as an evangelical, as a follower of Jesus Christ that believes in the Bible, we know crazy apocalyptic things will happen, but we're not supposed to be responsible for them. But when we see in someone else 
the same set of views, but as a photographic negative of ours, mm -hmm. right? We see that they have deep beliefs and they believe the end is near, but they believe they're supposed to go commit genocide to bring the Messiah. We believe we're supposed to preach the gospel to everyone and then the end will come. You know, that is a photographic negative as ever, but we can see why they believe this and I believe them. So therefore I take what these evil leaders say and what my novels do is extrapolate like a war game. Okay, this is what they believe. What if they, uh, they were to pursue in, in, the, in full their objectives? What would it look like? And hopefully it's entertaining, but hopefully when presidents and kings and prime ministers who read my books, uh, when they read it, they think, oh, I hadn't really thought of it this way. It's a way of educating as well. Well, you've been involved also on the Christian side of things to uh, let's bring peace to the Middle East. Right, and you've gone on several trips now to say, how can, how can we work together? Tell right. us about that. What, what started that for you? Well, what, what's interesting is King Abdullah of Jordan read one of my thrillers a few oh. years ago. It happened to be a thriller about the Islamic State trying to assassinate King Abdullah and overthrow the Kingdom of Jordan. And that, that would wait. get his interest. <laughs> and he, yeah, and he actually read one of that trilogy. And instead of banning me from the kingdom forever, he invited my wife and me to come for five days and get to know him. And it was fascinating. At the end of the time, we had a private dinner with him and I said, we have learned so much. We admired you before we came. We admire you more now because you're fighting the radicals. Would you be interested in if I brought a delegation of evangelical Christian leaders to come and do what we've done, take a few days to get to know you and your team? He said, let's do it. As it happened, I also got to meet President el-Sisi of Egypt just a few months later, and he asked for the same thing. So we put those trips back to back. Having done that, then the United Arab Emirates and the Saudis asked, would you come and we would like to begin a dialogue. We've never had a dialogue with evangelical Christians. Now, Gordon, I can't, I can tell you why I think they're inviting us, but why is God opening the doors now? Um, I believe it's so that we can be a, a, a loving, prayerful witness of the Lord Jesus Christ to all these leaders and to encourage these Arab leaders to make peace with Israel. Egypt and Jordan have, mm -hmm. the Saudis and the, the Gulf states have not, but I think they're moving in this direction. I think Saudi is close. And I'm encouraged. And that would that. be great if Yeah, that. it would be transformative. And uh, there is a prophecy to be fulfilled, and that's the highway from Assyria to Egypt. That's right, Isaiah 19. Uh, that would be, that. yeah, that would be we're, great. We're inching our fulfilled. way there bit yeah. by bit, and we need to keep praying for these leaders, Muslim and the, Isra the leaders of Israel, for, the, for peace. I don't currently, I'm not opt optimistic about peace between the Palestinian leadership and Israel. I think Abu Mazen has no interest in going to his grave as a peacemaker, but as someone who said, I never gave in. Well, if he, if he gave, if he entered into a peace deal, it would be a sure ticket to his grave. Well, he, uh, he would uh, be very assassinated. Possibly, very possibly, but the, That's the why Palestinian Arafat people are, couldn't. are suffering. Yeah, well, they're, they're, the people are suffering, poverty, Israel's growing, but who is interested? It's the Gulf states. They really want, and why? Because they're terrified of Iran. They see Israel as an ally, uh, not just of the United States, but an ally against Iran with them. And they want that relationship to go public. And I'm amazed by that. But sitting with these Arab leaders, I believe them. All right. Well, the book is called The Persian Gamble. It's available now wherever books are sold. Terry, over to you. Monica Hill lost her job over her drug habit. No surprise considering she worked at a pharmacy and was forging prescriptions for herself. Throughout her life, Monica bounced from one rehab stint to the next until she found a way to break the cycle once and for all. For years, Monica Hill lied to her parents about everything. She didn't want them to know she was a drug addict. I was afraid. I was afraid that more than anything, they would be so disappointed, heartbroken, hurt. There was a lot of guilt. I think I just felt like I was failing them. The daughter of Ecuadorian immigrants, Monica was the youngest of three and grew up in an Irish Catholic neighborhood in Chicago. We had a wonderful, wonderful childhood. My grandma was really the backbone of our family. 
and she was really the one who took care of me and raised me and taught me about God. She was popular and did well in school, gymnastics, music, and cheerleading. But in her sophomore year, she met a boy who was a dropout and liked to party and get high. I started using drugs. So then I was all into a different path. I really wasn't able to have a clear mind and, and break away from this relationship because then all of a sudden I found myself getting stuck in it in a completely different dimension. She stayed in the relationship throughout high school and college while keeping up her grades and working a full-time job. But her boyfriend had become controlling and abusive and she was afraid to leave him. While trying to figure out why I'm with this person and in this horrible relationship, this person's using drugs. So it's scary to try to escape this relationship. So I might as well use drugs with this person. So at least we have a common understanding in some way, some really sick way. Monica dropped out of college one class short of graduating. In 1993, she got pregnant with her daughter, Nikki. The same year, her boyfriend went to jail bringing an end to the relationship. I was no longer with her father, and I had this newfound sense of freedom, this independence that I had not had in over 10 years. I was able to live my life and do the things that I wanted to do. Monica was hopeful of the life that was ahead for her and Nikki. She remained drug-free for a couple of years, but after she got a job as a pharmacy tech, old habits returned was surrounded by a lot of prescription medications that I knew I had access to. And whether it was stealing the drugs or forging prescriptions or whatever it was that I needed to do to, to get my fix. This was the first of many jobs Monica lost to drug addiction. She was in and out of treatment a dozen times. She did manage to stay clean for three years, but in 2000, working at another pharmacy, she was back to writing prescriptions for herself. At one point of my life, I thought there was no hope for me. She was fired and lived in a hotel room with her daughter. I found myself one day just waking up and being in my bed and crying and thinking to myself, this is how I'm gonna have to live the rest of my life, every day for the rest of my life. Finally, in March of 2006, Monica met Jeff Hill, a former addict, through friends. There was something in him that I saw. It was something pure and sincere, and it was filled with hope. So when he started talking about freedom in Christ, it was something that was so foreign to me. And in the beginning, it was like hopeful, yet fearful. She started attending church with him and reading the Bible. I was literally in tears at one point because it was like, why am I not understanding this? Why am I not getting this? But I knew that there was something in there and I knew that I needed to just keep digging until it was my time to really understand. Three months later in church, Monica knew it was time to accept Jesus. I just went up there and I just said, okay, God, this is it. This is my, my turn. So here I am. And it wasn't like it was a light switch that went off, you know, and I went home and I was transformed in that instant, but something started to change. Jesus is a really serious thing because I knew, you know, I knew God growing up and I knew about Jesus and the sacrifice and the crucifixion and the resurrection. And I knew all of those things in my head, but at this point I knew that I had a responsibility in my heart. Also, at that time, I knew that I, I couldn't have freedom and joy and happiness and fulfillment. And I wouldn't be able to have that if I continued to use. Through God's strength, Monica stopped using drugs and trusted the Lord to work in her life. The biggest thing for me at that time was really carrying a lot of guilt and shame and condemnation because of all of the years that I was a single drug addicted mother and what I had put my daughter through. And I think at that time, God was really working on my heart and really trying to get me to let go of some stuff. It took a few years, but it, it came. 
In 2009, Monica and Jeff married, blending their families. Together, they run Serenity Village, one of the largest faith-based recovery programs in Minnesota. I am a new person, I am a new creation. That it doesn't matter what I've done in the past, doesn't matter what I may have said or not said, that God's love for me is unconditional and eternal, and that all of that is gone, it's forgotten. You know, that is one of the promises in the Word, that He forgives our sins as far as the East is from the West and remembers them no more. You know, it's, it's a part of who God is and a part of how He looks at us, but it's hard for us to stop remembering. It's hard for us to let go of our own sin, our own responsibility, our own shortcomings. And yet, in Him is the freedom we have been looking for. And one of the things I love about Monica's story is that it was a process, and she doesn't she doesn't cover that up. It's not like, like she just went like this and everything changed. Sometimes that happens for people, but I love the fact that she knew there was something more in that book, <laughs> and she was going to dig for it until she found what it was she needed. Just want to say to you today, if you're in a place where you're struggling and you don't feel like God could possibly love you, possibly forgive you, possibly meet you at the place of your need. Keep digging, keep looking, come to Him, empty it all out. He already knows it anyway. It's the safest place you could possibly be. And here's the message, He loves you anyway. You can't earn His love, it's free. He gives it to you, you're His creation. Now find out more about what His kingdom purposes are for you. It's all available. If you'd like somebody to pray with you about whatever the need in your life is, you can even do it anonymously. Call our 800 number. It's 1-800-700-7000. We'd love to be able to pray with you today. Gordon? Well, here's a word for you from Galatians chapter 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not, yet, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So today, say, for freedom. Christ has set me free. God bless you. We'll see you again.